I'm Ed Sperling. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Semiconductor Engineering. I'm over at OneSpin with Dominic Strasser, who's going to talk today about functional safety. Dominic, there's a lot more devices ending up in functional safety type of applications than in the past. Even if they weren't designed that way originally, what has to change from the design side? Well, the most critical thing is that you have to adhere to safety standards according to where your design is ending up in. Say you have built a camera chip and you have a new field of application which is uh, in the car, then your chip needs to follow the automotive standard for functional safety. So what have you drawn out here for us? Yeah, first of all, I have written down the various uh, safety standards with their strange numbers that uh, people are talking about and I wanted to tell you a little bit on what these standards are about and uh, these numbers uh, so that you can you that you know what uh, people are talking about. So we certainly know about ISO 26262 in automotive. What else is there? Yeah, there's uh, first of all in the top there's the, the um, common safety standard that is the um, the uh, tree, the, the top of the tree for all safety standards. Then there's the automotive standard, there's uh, IEC 62279 for railway, there's IEC 61511 for process industry, IEC 61513 for nuclear power plants, and IEC 62061 for machinery industry. So most of these standards were put into place in order both to correct problems that existed in the market, uh, we've seen all the crashes that have gone on and we're, we're all focused on that, as well as to prevent future problems that will crop up as, as more technology gets applied, right? Yes, exactly. So you have uh, procedures and processes to follow and using these and having these in place gives you a guideline on how to produce safer uh, devices. So what has to change on the design side? Well, on the design side, you have to, uh, the, it's all about tracing your, your development. So it's, uh, the, you have to be able to, to trace from the requirement going down to a feature that you implement, going down to the source code line that uh, implements uh, such a requirement. This is pretty much a best practices type of approach for design, right? Exactly. What we're trying to establish here, to some extent, is traceability, am I correct? Yes, exactly. So it's, uh, it's traceability and the traceability, the uh, reason for the traceability is liability, right? That this is where, where it all starts from. So if you, if you are traceable, if you, are, if you follow the process, then you are not liable for any malfunction. So, so why don't you give us an example? Yeah, so let's take uh, the most uh, commonly used standard, which is the automotive standard, as there's many more cars than nuclear power plants in the world. So let's say you have a car here and a car manufacturer of this car, and uh, there's some OEM supplier supplying some box to, which is built into the car, and you are the producer of this integrated circuit here that is built into the box that, is, that eventually ends up in the car. And here's your design process. You start from some Verilog file, you're using some tool, to, just like a synthesis tool, to produce another intermediate uh, representation, and you use other tools on the way down to the bitstream that will end up eventually in the FPGA that is uh, later put into the car. So what you need is to, so and you have a lot of tools on, in this chain, right? What you need is to qualify and uh, to qualify all the tools that are in the chain because when there is a malfunction in the car it is eventually being tracked down to the OEM box that was built into the car, to the IC that you produced and to maybe some uh, error in the Verilog that you had or some tool malfunction here at this point. So the tools have to be qualified here too. What's that, what, what's that process and uh, how effective is that? Yeah, basically you have uh, two choices, right? The choice number one is that you are qualifying the tool, you as, a, as the producer of the IC and the owner of the process. So you qualify this tool by adding some verification step, for example, or by doing a, a second tool in parallel that uh, gives you certainty that uh, the tool did not malfunction, which is a quite tedious process to set up. Tools have been going through a whole qualification process here. What does that buy you if the tool is pre-qualified? 
Yeah, the, the big uh, advantage is that if the tool is qualified and has some uh, certification, then it's not you that needs to set up uh, the, the validation of the tool, but the tool is coming pre-qualified to you, so it's safe to use the tool in your flow. This is still a fairly fluid type of market though, right? Because all the, st all the, the technology is continually changing, the tools are being updated, uh, there are new tools being added in there. Um, you're combining things that are not necessarily static. What does that mean for the design process? Well, adding a new tool is a, is a difficult task. So um, it depends on, on where you, where you are uh, using this tool, whether it's a verification tool or where, whether it's a tool that could insert a problem into your uh, design chain. So um, depending on, on, the, on the criticality of the tool, you need to, to undergo steps to, uh, to allow actually the usage. So accidents will still happen, but are you confident that the standards and the tools that are coming into place are sufficient to prevent them in the future? Or that is it the design side that, that's causing the problems? Is it human error? Where do you see the future here? I mean, using tools for verification is uh, excluding human errors. And uh, having tools in place, just uh, humans are, by nature, do errors, right? And uh, by, by having tools supply, you, you rule out uh, human errors. One of the issues that the industry is wrestling with right now is what is good enough? Is good enough as good as a human or is good enough perfect for a machine? Well, it, it, it depends on where your device is in use, right? So there's, uh, there's uh, less, um, less critical uh, applications and more critical applications. And uh, so the standards give you a guideline on where to apply how much of verification. And uh, they give you a guideline and, and uh, even they give you up to percentages which, uh, how much verification needs to be executed. Dominic Strasser, thanks for a good glimpse into what is going to become a very important piece of semiconductor design going forward. Thanks, Ed.